In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspiration, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee, be happy in through Christ our Lord. Amen. Virgin most prudent, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I want to just kind of wrap up a few things that um, sometimes they call these the sins against marriage. There's, and these are the things that demons will actually drive in order to cause difficulties within the family. Um, we've talked a little bit about things like ill usage and denying the marital debt and things of that sort, but there's a few other ones. One of the things that will very often happen is that they will drive kind of a want or a lack of gentleness and consideration in regard to each other's faults. What the demons will do is, I mentioned, they affect people's perceptions. And so one of the things that they'll do is they'll step in, and then when they see the fact, they'll get the person who's suffering. One spouse is causing difficulties. The other spouse, the spouse that's suffering that difficulty, they will get that spouse to actually think, to focus on their own suffering rather than on the, uh, the, the good of the spouse, Right? One of the hallmarks of Our Lady, when she was standing beneath the cross, is that even though it's her son being put to death, and she is seeing the gravity of deicide, and she's seeing how bad men are behaving in relationship to God and putting him to death, and the degree of suffering that she's going through, the fathers of the church say that she was the one comforting the people at the foot of the cross, not them, her. And so even in her own pain, she still was willing to take on the pain or the suffering of other people to comfort them. And I think the same thing has to be said. We have to have that same kind of attitude in our relationships. <clears throat> that we can't, we should be gentle and have a certain kind of consideration and seek to help other people rather than trying to just club them over the head when we're in pain. We shouldn't really act out of the pain. Another one is saying injurious words. You know, sometimes in marriage, you'll get this where people are in an argument, and the first, the, it's, it's always, the, <laughs> you see this in certain marriage, it's go for the juggler, right? Try and figure out the most painful, brutal, difficult thing you can say to the individual so that you can kind of top them and kind of have them under control or what have you. And you see this from time to time. Uh, neglect of responsibility towards the children. Um, that's becoming a bigger problem recently. Um, you'll see this. There's certain people that are having children today. And we won't call them the millennials, but that's what they are. <laughs> and they literally will call their parents and say, would you come take care of my child for a week so we can go on vacation? Really? My, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's like my parents' group. You... You just, when you became a parent, that meant if you had a vacation, you had to tote the kid with you, and you had to go to certain places where you could take kids. Okay. So there's, the demons will kind of drive this, you know, it, part of it is, too, is this, you know, you deserve a break. Really? You know, the kid isn't getting a break from you. All right. Lack of affection. We've talked a little bit about that. Over-affection. Lack of technical, lack of nurturing. <laughs> As I've mentioned, demons understand child psychology extraordinarily well. And so what they'll do is they'll drive the difficulties. This goes back to my observation. One of the reasons that demons like us wounded is not just to keep us blocked from our union with God, which is the ultimate reason they want us wounded. But they also want parents wounded, and they want to pick at those wounds, and they want to aggravate those wounds so that the child can't be properly raised and the child ends up suffering from it so that he ends up wounded because they want to perpetuate the woundedness in order to keep people from, uh, uh, from God. Also, part of it is they're malice, right? They, they actually get a certain delight out of causing us physical harm and psychological harm and spiritual damage. They get a delight out of it. Although one time... One demon said to me, he, uh, he admitted that, yeah, he gets that sadistic delight when he gets people to fall, using the area of the Sixth Commandment. He gets that sadistic delight, but he says every time it does it, it increases his shame. 
because now he's got yet something else he has to account for. Okay. So putting children in the middle of the argument. So this is one of the things that the children will, the, the demons will say, you know, you should use your children like pawns, right? So that the child becomes the bone of contention. This is why I mentioned before, never arguing in front of the children. In men, driving effeminacy in relationship to their taking headship, because demons have an absolute loathing of authority, except when they're in charge, then what they do is, is they will constantly chisel away at that. And one of the ways they will do that is not just by making the wife controlling and become a bit of a battle axe, but they actually do it primarily by driving something that is the result of Adam's sin, which is he just wants peace. So instead of willing to do the hard and arduous and difficult thing and maintain his authority in a rightly ordered way, a lot of times they drive the, 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 the um, husband to use his authority in a disordered way. But a lot of times they will drive the husband just to abdicate his authority so that he doesn't have to deal with his wife's chattering or that things will simply go better. <clears throat> Sometimes today it's just being responsible is difficult and they just don't want to deal with it anymore. Guys just say, ah, I don't want to bother. Another thing that demons will do is, is this, and it's, not, it's, part, it's based on human psychology in large part. They will drive difficulties in the relationship for a long period of time. They'll actually drive the woman to become more controlling and then when the guy gets, he's had it, so he just kind of goes to his man cave. Then God will give, <coughs> it's kind of funny, God will give the woman a grace to see the necessity for her own spiritual advancement to subordinate to her husband. I tell women this all the time. If you can master the curse of Eve, if you can master this desire to control and in a rightly ordered and in a virtuous way submit yourself to your husband, once you do that, you will advance very rapidly in perfection. And you can advance very rapidly in perfection through that. If you never master that, you will never master a single virtue. Never. And how do you know this? Modesty. Part of modesty is comportment in your speech. When you're yakking at your husband and trying to control him, that's contrary to modesty. It's contrary to circumspection, keeping track of your surroundings. It's contrary to prudence. It's not helping matters. You're making things worse. It's contrary to fortitude because part of fortitude is just controlling yourself. It's part of temperance because why? You want that satisfaction of him doing what you want. It literally destroys all the virtues. But in man, that effeminacy and not being willing to take responsibility and to sacrifice yourself for your wife is the very thing that destroys his ability to advance in virtue. If you can't master those two, you're never going to attain any perfection in any virtue whatsoever. And the demons will pick at the guy to, to make him effeminate. What is effeminacy? St. Thomas defines it as a putting aside what is arduous in order to pursue what is, uh, and, and to pursue the pleasurable, right? Unwilling to put aside one's pleasure in order to pursue the arduous. So then he says with sloth, which most men have spiritual sloth, he says, he defines it the same way, unwillingness to put aside one's pleasure in order to pursue its arduous. So then another question he asks is, well, what's the difference? And he says this, he said, effeminacy is an attachment to the pleasure, whereas sloth is an aversion more, it's, the emphasis is more on the aversion to what is difficult and, and hard. So the demons will pick at people, at, the, at, the, at men, to get them to just pursue the life of pleasure and peace rather than maintaining the right order. In the end, though, the, ch the children pay the price, and so does the wife, ultimately. Demons drive parents to manifest their vices in front of the children. In other words, they get the, the spouses to be, uh, or the parents to be angry or what have you. Why? Because they know it has a psychological impact on the formation of the child. So if you, every time something happens, you blow your lid, you get angry and use vulgarity, when the kid gets of a certain age, when that same thing happens, what's the associations in his mind? 
It literally is, well, you get angry and you blow your lid and then you use vulgarity. And then you wonder, well, well my kid turned out just like me. Imagine that. All right. Another thing that demons try and do is get people to tolerate bad behavior in their children. It's an arduous thing to be consistent in maintaining discipline with your children. It's difficult. It takes a lot of work and it requires a lot of self-sacrifice and it's a lot of, a, a lot of discipline. And so they'll very often, you know, I, I'm convinced that with some people, this whole business of not wanting to spank their children is just because they don't want to go through the hassle and the pain emotionally of doing it themselves. And you're seeing that more and more today where people see that. But they'll tolerate the bad behavior in the children. Now, you don't, every time a child does something wrong, you don't correct it every single time they do it wrong. In fact, in Scripture it says, fathers, don't nag your children, lest they lose heart. Okay. So, the, and because why? Because then if you're correcting it every single time, then eventually the kid feels, well, I can't do anything right. But there has to be a consistency and a fairness, right? You also have to not tolerate the ten, uh, the temper tantrums. I mentioned the other day, you know, people will bring their nine, their 10-year-old boy to us and he's just completely out of control. And I said, when was the last time you spanked him? Well, we never have. Well, there's your problem. Um, you also see this with children. children. The demons will drive children to press the buttons of their parents. Children are extremely perspicacious. They know exactly what button to get mom to blow her lid or exactly what to do to get father to react in a specific way. And so the demons will use that, but this is why the parents can't tolerate it. Um, another thing is, too, is, is that sometimes people will neglect their duties at home under the guise of actually doing their duty. So, for example, if you look at this battery... It actually says workaholic on it. I saw that on, hmm, that's worth talking about. Sometimes you'll get men who will literally spend all their time at work. Now, sometimes it's a way to escape their wives and their family. But other times they do it in order to, because they, their, their ambition is, is they want a certain level of living, a certain level of lifestyle, bef you know, and they, they're unwilling to kind of put that aside and live a slightly lower lifestyle so that they can actually be home. One of the things that the demons will do is, is they will get people to uh, get their priorities out of whack. They will suggest to the person that, you know, really what you need to do is you need to make this living for your family, right? And they'll even get to the point where you see this with some certain husbands. The wife is doing everything so that the husband can work. Now, there's a certain sense when that has to be done to some degree in order to financially survive. But you, the demons will try and get the guys to think that really the family and everybody is there for their career, for their work, rather than the other way around. The work is there for the family. And you see this with guys who are extremely ambitious. They start neglecting their family because of the, and they start seeing the, the achieving of the success as an end in itself rather than seeing it as achieving the success for the sake of being able to survive for the family. On the other hand, you'll also get people just to want to deny their state in life. Uh, more than once, women who have come to, have come to me that have been married for 30-some years, usually 20 to 30 years, they'll might have anywhere from seven to nine children, and they'll tell me, say, Father, you know, I th I've been discerning my vocation, and I think I'm supposed to be a nun. <laughs> really? And they said, yes, because I keep getting these feelings that I want to be alone and pray with God. <laughs> so when you tell them, you know, demons can give you insp inspirations to do spiritual works as long as it's going to be contrary to your spiritual well-being. And they kind of give you this pale look. And so when you have to tell them, no, you're, you're, you, God's will for you is you go home and take care of your children and your husband. Right. So you'll, you'll see that from time to time. The other thing is, too, is you'll get these guys that spend all their time in recreation and doing every other thing than other than taking care of their family. But they, it's, always to, it's always kind of a chiseling away at people, at, at least in relationship to their state in life, trying to get that. And that's not even true just about marriage. It's true even about the priesthood and things like that. But they're always trying to get people to neglect 
those things that pertain to marriage. I'm going to stop there because I suspect people have some questions and you can ask your questions. Yes? Um, you've given us a lot of information. Um, you have, I know you have some books. What do you suggest for like, the newbie person who's just getting better on meditation? Do you have any books for that or prayers for your family? Um, if you're if if you're just starting out, I don't recommend anything I've written. <laughs> so, um, although actually the sermons are probably okay, you know, those are probably probably okay. Um, if you're really starting out with your faith and you're really trying to get the depth of your faith, and even in stuff in relationship to marriage, the, one of the best books out there is called The Catechism Explained by Spirago. And basically what it is, is it's an extended commentary on the Catechism of the Council of Trent. It's one of the most fantastic catechisms that's ever been written. So it's really good, because you can actually go into various facets, and even in marriage, or the sacrament of marriage and things of that sort. So that's kind of where I would start. If you're looking for prayer books, the two that I would probably recommend right off the bat is I think they republished it. It's just called the Manual of Prayers from the Third Council of Baltimore. It's a really good prayer book that you can start praying, and it even has stuff for wives and husbands, etc. If you're looking for de- to, stu- to deal with stuff that has to do with the spiritual warfare, you can buy the book that I just put out um, called Deliverance Prayers for the Laity. So the um, getting the imprimatur seems to take extraordinarily long these days. Deliverance prayers for the laity. Because those are all prayers that the general consensus among the exorcists is, is that these are general prayers that lay people can actually make use of. Um, in some of those prayers, people complain that, you know, well, these came from the Protestants. Actually, they didn't. So, for example, the binding prayers. Most people don't know that binding prayers, if you actually look, there's four times in Scripture where they talk about binding of demons. There's six times binding of demons is mentioned in the Manual of Exorcism of 1617. There's two times it's mentioned in the Psalm Rite of Exorcism, and one time it's mentioned in Chapter 3. The binding of demons is a very common thing in the history of the Catholic Church, as the Protestants happen to rediscover it. But it's the question, real question, is who has the authority to do it, and how do you do it? And that's why the book might be a little bit helpful, because I talk about when and when you cannot do it, based upon the theology of the church and what the exorcists have noticed through experience, which is not just mine, it's actually other exorcists. And then also what the, you know, who can do it, and then how to do it. Because it's a lot of it is, is that people end up biting off more than they can chew. So... So in there, there's a, that would be helpful for people to learn, especially because you can, a lot of those prayers can be very helpful in marriage. Prayers for healing, there's also prayers for healing in there, which are really helpful for people who have been wounded sometime in their past or even within their marriage. Okay. Yes? How can a Catholic be uh, possessed if they are filled with the Holy Spirit? Would that preclude them being possessed by a demon? Uh, no, because possession is in the body, Grace, which is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, is in the soul. So a person can actually be possessed and still be in the state of grace. And actually, some of the holiest people I've met were people who were possessed, ironically. Yes? Can you just repeat the titles of the Catechism Explained by Spirago. And then um, the Manual of Prayers by, from the Third Council of Baltimore. Uh, and then also Deliverance Prayers for the Laity. I think all of those are available on Amazon. Of course, Amazon is this monster. <laughs> a friend of mine has come up with an acronym, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. <laughs> so that's it. And he calls it FANG. Right? So, <laughs> anyway, okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, I know you mentioned that the, blood of, the pressure of the blood of Christ is very powerful against the devil. Right. So I just want to know why is it it not given to us in the Latin Mass? Uh, the reason, the primary reason, has to do with the danger of sacrilege, in the sense that it could easily be spilled and lost. And actually, that's one of the reasons why a lot of dioceses are getting away from it. So historically, that's the actual reason. That's part of the reason. 
The second reason is, is the church condemned the proposition that you actually have to receive it under the species of wine in order to receive the full Christ. So historically, one of the reasons they restricted it just to the, just to the host is because in the host is the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And so in order to avoid this idea that you, can, oh, you have to receive, because the Protestants started this, in the very beginning, that if you, if, if you don't receive it under the species of wine, you're not receiving the blood of Christ. Actually, you are in the host. You're receiving the, to- the whole Christ. So that was one of the reasons, uh, too, why the church said no to it. So, yeah. Um, in being submissive to your husband, um, how do you do that? Okay. <laughs> you stand there with a rolling pin smacking it in your hand it comes in a few ways the first is by recognizing his legitimate authority and not usurping his authority in other words letting him make the decisions giving him your counsel and letting him make the decisions the second is developing the virtue of piety Piety is, uh, sorry, take that back, dulia. It's technically dulia. Dulia is the virtue in which we have honor for those who are above us. Piety is specifically for our parents. But if you have the virtue of dulia, basically what it is is that you should have a certain reverence and appreciation and respect for the authority that God has given him, not because of him, but because God has given it to him. And so developing that, that appreciation and respect for the authority will go a long ways to help you do that. The second thing is always observe modesty. St. Thomas says, you know, I'm, I'm, when I went to my spiritual director after I finished my last book, which just came out two days ago, but they, they um, I told them, I said, which book should I work on next? My spiritual director, I said, I really want to do the one on modesty. He says, no, you don't. Because he knew I kept putting off the book on how demons influence us, cycle, or how demons influence us, because it's a, it's a, the, the notes alone are like 400 pages. So he's he's like, no, you've got to write that book because that's what God, that's your vocation. You need to write that. But in this modesty book that I'm working on, I've already got the notes pretty much ready for it. Saint Thomas talks about there's a subvirtue to modesty, and he calls it stability to authority, and or sorry, equality to a stable authority. And what that means is, is that your behavior in relationship to an authority should always fit the authority that the person has. And so what that basically means is, is because your husband is your head, by the way, his headship, uh, well, I'll talk about that in, in just a minute, but he, that there should be a certain modesty in any time you in, in talk with him or engage with him so that that respect is properly shown. And that's something that you need to teach the children, that there needs to be this respect and relationship to it. When I grew up, if you, if, if in fact, I, asked, I actually saw my 16-year-old sister get spanked by my father once because she called my mom a, a derogatory term, and my dad said, you did use it, and so that was it. Right. In other words, you have to you you have to make sure that any time you're approaching him, that you're doing it in a way that shows respect for his office as the head of the household. His office is there to provide and to protect. So developing a gratitude and appreciation for the protection and for the um, uh, and for the providence that your husband is providing for you will also help. But it primarily has to do with respecting the authority by not countermanding him unless there's grave cause, or at least waiting until the time is opportune to discuss something with him and offer him your counsel and then leaving it alone and not holding on to it and not trying to drive it. Ab- above all, to try not to control him. So that's, those, that's just kind of the beginnings of it. Yes? Are the world, the flesh, and the devil kind of equal influences, or is, are the flesh and the world really guided and used by the personal demons, and how does that relate to the concupiscence of the flesh, right. concupiscence of the eyes, and the crown of life? Well, actually, you just said <laughs> those three correlate to the, the three forms of temptation. The world, the flesh, and the devil, they all hinge on the flesh, which is concupiscence, so they all hinge on that. So they all, it, they all actually... So the demons can't tempt us unless it somehow it's going to give us something in the flesh and the, or acts upon the flesh, or they can act upon the flesh, and the world acts upon the flesh, and the demons use the world in order to act upon the flesh. So it all f- hinges around the flesh, so it's really a matter of destroying concupiscence. It's really a matter of destroying the concupiscence um, which is this tendency, or it's a disordination, 
um, a disorder of the appetites or the lower um, faculties towards pleasure. And so that's the one thing that, that has to be crushed in the process of conquering all temptation. This is one of the reasons why the demons have a particular aversion to two kinds of people, people who pray a lot and people who fast a lot. The reason being is, is because through the fasting you get your body under control. So if he tries to tempt you, you're much more sensitive to it. Because as, you, as many of you have probably noticed, if you fast for any length of time, after a while your body becomes much more acute. In fact, when you indulge too much, your body, your senses become dulled, right? So then, um, but they also don't like prayer because in prayer you're filling your mind with God. And so when something contrary comes into that, you're much more quick to react. And so um, prayer and fasting are two of the principal ways in which you crush that. <clears throat> Obviously pride, every demon fell out of pride. They all wanted something above their state. So, um, but anyway, that's actually those, uh, actually that would be a good conference for me to do at some point on the, um, uh, the threefold eyes. That would be good. Yes. What was, what's the best way that you recommend for men to stop being so feminine and become more masculine? I think that there's several things. The principal thing is if you're married, start assuming responsibility for your family, for your wife. Start praying more often. Start doing the things that are difficult on a spiritual level. But in taking care of your wife, realize your authority is not for you. It's for her. The, every, what most people don't seem to realize is that, it, especially because things are so disordered today, when you get into a position of authority, the actual office or the, of the authority is actually for the benefit of those underneath you, not for the one who has it. So as long as you're, do, you're using your authority for the well-being of your wife and your children, but I think it's taking responsibility. So if you look at um, what, did, what did God actually do to Adam? He said, oh, because you've done this, you will work all the days of your life. In other words, now you've got a supporter. You have to take responsibility for her in thorns, right? And by the sweat of your brow. So now basically what's going to happen is, is he did exa exactly what countermands um, effeminacy in men. Suffering and responsibility. That's what Fulton Sheen said. We mature by suffering and responsibility. And so this is what guys have to engage in. They have to engage in stuff that's physically and arduously difficult, that's spiritually uh, difficult, um, like prayer, fasting, working on chastity, things of that sort. But then they also have to take the responsibility and don't abnegate the responsibility and be willing to suffer those things in relationship to it. Part of the suffering part is also that willingness to sacrifice. And that's the thing that most guys don't seem to understand. Women will submit if, the hu if they see that the husband is sacrificing for her. He's willing to put himself aside for her. But the minute she sees he's selfish, she's not going to submit. And that's just part of human nature. On the other hand, women have to understand that if she submits, the guy will have this inclination to want to love her and to sacrifice for her. And so that's the thing that they have to do. St. Paul says, love your wives, which means what? Will good for them despite how you feel, ultimately. Yes. Yeah. Um. What are some things that can be done to repair damage that may have occurred in your family due to either demonic um, influence of some sort or you know, poor decisions that maybe perhaps you have made in regard to that influence? In spiritual warfare, you've heard me say this, but spiritual warfare, precision is everything. So you need to know what the nature of the diabolic influence, if it's there. A, you need to know if it's there, because sometimes it can just be psychological and it's just caused a lot of um, emotional damage. But you need to know whether there's even something, whether there's a natural explanation or whether there's a diabolic or both. But you need to know the nature of the diabolic influence. And this is why I tell people, pray to Our Lady of Sorrows to reveal to you what's the nature of this demon I'm dealing with. And then from there, if it's like a demon of fear or anger or depression or whatever the case is, then you start working on the virtues contrary to that and then there's some prayers you can say to combat him. If it's something that is significant, like you know somebody engaged in satanic worship or something like that, and as a result of that, now we've got this thing in our family, I would say you need to see a priest or an exorcist. But usually, I tell people to just start yourself with you know praying, doing those things, uh, you know receiving the sacraments, praying regularly, doing all those things that become a good Catholic, etc., making use of the sacramentals but then also saying the prayers to Our Lady and once you find out 
<coughs> what the specificity of, his, of him is, then you can start doing the virtues contrary to that. So it's really about knowledge. You got, if, to correct a problem, you've got to know what the problem is. And so you just have to ask Our Lady, reveal to me what the problem is. And then from there, you can then talk to a priest about, okay, how do we repair the damage? Yes. Because there's so many different kinds of ways that demons can damage family life. Yeah. So we, we have guardian angels who are specific to us. Is yes. There a cor- is there a corollary on the demonic side where there are particular demons that are attached that are drawn to us? Or is it they kind of shuffle through? All of the above. In other words, in this sense, in the sense that there's some discussion, and it, it doesn't seem to have some support from the hierarchy, but there's not, I haven't seen, someone said, no, the church condemned that. And I said, well, could you provide me the information? He never could. But that basically, some think that Satan, in looking at you to mock God, he assigns a guardian demon to your life. But I think that's a bit of a stretch because of the fact that some people have what we call a familiar. That's just from the time they're born, they seem to have something. <laughs> What I tend to think is, is that they look at your disposition and then the demon that tends to, that, that the sin that you're most likely to be inclined to because of your disposition, he tends to be the guy to show up to tempt you from time to time and try and get his foot in your life. That would probably be more my read on it than anything else. Although once in a while the demons will, there, there is somebody that, that, that Satan has assigned a demon to afflict somebody, but that's a case-by-case basis. So. Yes. What are your thoughts on the recent translation of the Exorcism Rite right into English, both the intent behind it and how efficacious you think it'll be compared to the last? Uh, ironically, I have a, a slightly more benign position to it than most. Um, it's a qualified benign position in relationship to it. First of all, As you probably know, the people that wrote the New Rite of Exorcism, none of them were experienced exorcists. And you can tell it. When you read through this, you're like, what? You're not going to do that then. Like, for example, you'll start out the ritual, then all of a sudden you stop and you have the celebration of the blessing of water. Excuse me, the thing's sticking to the ceiling. I don't think we have time for that. (laughs) I mean, you're just like, who... Who comes up with this? The other thing is, too, is they call the new rite of exorcism a celebration. Let me get this straight. Torturing. Torturing an intelligent creature to the point where his pain is so extreme that he would rather give you information and end up back in hell than go through what he's going through. You're going to call that a celebration? That's sick. <laughs> right? I mean... It's, 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 you know, it's the same thing of calling the, the Mass a celebration. The Mass is a celebration. It's a sacrifice. We're, we're commemorating putting Christ to death. Right? So there, there's this misnomer in relationship to it. The other thing is, too, is, is that they reduced several things in it, which was a disaster. They removed numerous things that were diagnostic in nature. So, for example, there's one part in, the, in, the, uh, in chapter 2, which is the solemn rite of exorcism in the old rite, where you just start naming various facets of Satan, the insider of incest, the um, cause of discord. You just go down all these things that this guy does, and when the demon pings off of that, then you know there's something about this that's going to help you. They removed all of that stuff. They don't even call it... They say, well, you're not supposed to call demons names. You're not calling them names. You're, you are enumerating his titles, his defects. The other side of it is, too, is they removed most of the actual commanded adjurations. So, you know, in, in, the, in the old rite, it's literally, I command you to this, I command you to that, I command you to this, I command you to that. In the new rite, you might do that once or twice. So it's really anemic. However... About one out of a hundred demons actually reacts more to deprecatory prayers than imprecatory prayers. Now, deprecatory prayers are when you petition God for something, and in that particular case, it might be useful. I've never found it, but it might be useful. The second component is is that it might be um, so it might be useful in one in a hundred cases, but most of the time it's not. This thing is translating it into English, I think, is a mistake. Now, I know why they're doing it. They're doing it because of the fact that most priests, even the ones that I train, out of the 50 that we're training now, probably only five know Latin well enough 
to be able to actually make their way through the ritual. And so a lot of times, they, so they wanted this thing to be translated in English. Here's the problem. They put out a version in 1999. Didn't work. So then they put out another version. I think it was 2001. Now they're talking about putting out yet another edition. And my basic attitude is, look, you're obviously not getting the point. How is a committee stretched over a year and a half, which I think is all the time they spent on it, or something like that, maybe it's three years. How is a committee in three years going to derive a ritual that is as efficacious as one that was fashioned over 20 centuries by extraordinarily experienced exorcists and saints? That is just gross hubris to think you're going to do that. So just put the thing aside. My theory is to add a chapter four. Although, ironically, we call chapter four, well, we need to do chapter four. That's when you think someone's faking and you just read something about, you know, <laughs> how the Grinch stole Christmas in Latin to see if they react. <laughs> but, the, but as a diagnostic tool. But the point is, is that they could have just added some prayers in the, in the back, like to Our Lady or things of that sort, or, you know, incorporated some of the um, rites of exorcism, like the one that I put out in the manual for, of uh, the minor exorcisms, which... Um, priests can use. They could have incorporated some of that stuff, especially the stuff on marriage, and, and um, there's an exorcism, uh, Quorum Sanctissima, which is extraordinarily effective. They could have added stuff like that, but instead they decided they were going to come up with it. Now part of it has to do with, um, and if you've listened to my conferences, you know I kind of rant about this a little bit, uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about Latin. The Part of it has to do with, uh, I mean, I hate to say this, but the greatest generation was one of the most, was one of the worst generations in the history of this planet. Think about it. They went from a church that was at its spiritual, moral, and financial peak, prime, at least in this country. And within their one generation, they handed us a church that is financially, spiritually, and morally bankrupt. They were the ones that got rid of all the discipline. They were the ones who swept aside the entire tradition and revamped literally everything. They literally could not keep their hands off of anything that the church's patrimony was offering. And so the, the rite of exorcism was the last thing. And so that's why they, that's why they just, they can, literally cannot leave it alone. That is a sign of moral depravity, I'm sorry. The point being is, is that, that they just couldn't leave the thing alone. Back to the Latin, why put it in English? Well, I don't even know why they're translating this particular version in English because they're just about to come out with another one in Latin and they're going to have to translate that one again. But the other point of it is, is that the demons, don't. They, Latin is a sacred language. Everybody's got this idea that languages are sacred because they occur in scripture. That's actually not true. If you actually look at the fathers of the church, they say there are three sacred languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Not because they occur in scripture, but because they occur as the languages affixed to the instrument of our salvation, the cross. That's what makes them sacred. And so the demons consider Latin sacred, not only because of that, but because it's the language of the mystical body of Christ, the church. And they consider even the pronunciation sacred. They don't even want to do that. So I think to, to, and which basically means you reduce the efficacy of the prayer in that process, which I think is a mistake. And a lot of exorcists, or not a lot, because there's not that many exorcists that use the new rite of exorcism because they've all, some numerous guys have tried it, and they've, they've even just looked at it, and they just said this thing ain't working, so they just go back to the old one anyway. So, yes? Um, you have given us many beautiful uh, teachings on uh, God's role for men and women. And um, how would you counsel families where one of the spouses are abusive alcoholics, where um, being able to celebrate the role of a woman to men would be very difficult? Right, that's correct. The submission to the husband is, re is based upon, well, the authority, let me back up. The authority of the husband as the head of the household is based on a natural law of right, which means it's circumscribed and conditioned by the natural law. So if there are abuses or things that are occurring by abuses, I don't mean minor ones, because guys are always going to do stupid things. But if you're talking about grave abuses or things of that sort, 
then the actual right to make use of that authority is suspended, and what the wife will actually have to take the place of those things that he's abnegating, not all of them. That's what the moralists say. But then as soon as he gets his act together, then his right to exercise that authority resumes. If you're talking about things like alcoholism and things like that, it's the, same, the principle is basically as a matter of charity, you should, st- you should still pray for them and to do what you can for them and to help them to see the problem and help them to get through it so that they can resume their duties in relationship to that. So it's really about the family coming together. And that may require that, like in the case of the, if the... If the husband's an alcoholic or something like that or abusive, the wife may have to help the children to learn to moderate their suffering and their their pain in relationship to him and be able to pray for him so that he changes so that it's not painful anymore. So, yes. Wow, thank you, Father. My wife's been elbowing me the whole night. See what you're doing wrong? See what you're doing wrong? Uh, First of all, Father, thank you. You're such a blessing. You've given us so much information. I'm your new number one fan. So I got two questions. Sure. The first one is, uh, can a lay person pray the long form Pope Leo the Thirteenth prayer for himself in the privacy of his home? Okay. Yeah. Uh, when the when that was first published in 1897, I think is the year it was published in the Act Apostolic that said, "Is Pius the Eleventh or not Pius Leo the Thirteenth said that any layman can use this." That was the understanding. The prayer was then modified and then republished, I think, in 1928. Don't quote me on the dates. The, that former version is now forbidden use to everyone. The current version, which you see in the Ritual Romanum of 1962, is the one that only priests can use. And the Pontifical Commission of Ecclesia Day, in conjunction also with the CDF, so the CDF came out in 1985 and said that um, priests, uh, or sorry, that lay people were forbidden the use of that prayer entirely. So they can't pray a part of it, not even privately, nothing. They said, then the PCD came out and said that the priests can only use it publicly when they have permission of the local ordinary, but they are permitted to say it as a private prayer. So that's where it stands right now, according to legislation of the church. And part of this is that you'll see this because there are lay people who are saying it. In fact, there's websites who encourage people to say it because they don't, they won't accept the fact that the, the CDF said, no, this is actually restricted to clergy. And it was restricted to clergy, not just in 1985. It was restricted to clergy a long time ago that only a bishop or a priest with the permission of his ordinary could say this prayer publicly. So that restriction has been around for a while, but they don't want to accept it. But the difficulty is, is that's why those people show up on my doorstep from time to time because they're being retaliated against because they're doing something they don't have the authority to do. So. Second question is, is the newer right of exorcism given in 1998 as effective as the older right of exorcism from the 1614 AD? Not my experience. Now, again, you're always going to have some demon that just doesn't fit the pattern. And so it might work more with him. But generally speaking, exorcists, even new right exorcists, say no, the old one is just much more effective, just in our experience. And part of it is that the, 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 the one, the chapter two is actually a codification or um, it's a codification of one that had been around for a while and one modified that there were various forms of it before then and so when it was finally um, codified it kind of became fixed after that but there were various forms of it so that this thing has been around in various forms for at least 18 17 to 1800 years so um, and definitively, at least since the time of Gregory the Great, but it's it's there's precursors before that, and so it's just it has a kind of a patrimony and a lineage. The other thing is too is demons have perfect memory, so every time you say that over them, they remember some saint who beat them over the head with that same thing, right? And so they, they, it's, they're much more sensitive to this thing because it's just been around a while. You know, if somebody beat you and they were always beating you with a particular stick, and then one day they put out another stick, and they took a beating. Which stick are you going to have the, one, the less this is, uh, affection for? <laughs> it's going to be the one that they beat you the most with. And I think that's part of this equation, too. 
Okay, so, yes. Two, um, two very brief questions. First, why did you get rid of the minorities and major orders, and especially the, the minority of exorcists? What was it exactly, and why was it named exorcists? Well, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, let's just answer that first, and then you can answer the same question. Historically, the, uh, the minor orders, according to the theology and the history of the church, basically what happened was is that all of the minor orders and the major orders are contained in the in the episcopate, or at least in the in the um, depending on the debate on which side of the debate, but it's contained in the priesthood. When they decided to make deacons, they basically took out those sections that were already contained in it. Then later, right after, after um, the time of the apostles, there's an unpacking over about a course of 200 years, if I understand the history correct, although I'm open to correction, that they, they unpacked the remaining of these. They removed them out and separated them out, um, all the minor orders. And in the minor orders are a gradation in order to become, um, uh, to become a priest. But they, historically, though, the minor orders also could stand on their own. So you actually had exorcists up until... Um, just a little bit before Trent, that basically the exorcists were um, given, depending on the bishop's permission, exorcists who had the minor order of exorcists could actually perform solemn exorcisms over people without being a priest. Later, it gets merged after Trent with the priesthood, and that's it. They can't. It becomes what they call a potesta. It's not a potesta leg, um, uh, legata. It's a potest restricta. It's a restricted power well, because even deacons can use it when they baptize. So, um, but it's a restricted power, and so as a result of that, um, whereas a, a potest legata means that you can't use it, period. So, but the point is, is that um, being a restricted power, then, then what happened is, is Paul VI comes along and pretty much wipes out, it just says, no, the minor orders, we're not going to confer them anymore. But the interesting thing of it is, is that there's, there's a couple of components to this which are really disastrous. In the old rite, in the, um, and when you receive tonsure, which is the order of making a cleric, in that tonsure, you're actually, go, you're, you're actually taking on a change of state in life. So you're going from a layman to a cleric, right? At least that's the discussion. Now, where that stands right now, because the whole canonical question of what a cleric is, is another matter. But the point being is that historically that meant that when you were in the seminary and you were there for a little while and you could demonstrate that you could live chastely because that's what you need to do to be a cleric, once you became a cleric you had to change a state and that meant you were receiving the grace of state to be chaste. That meant that the guy after his first year in the seminary had seven years where he was using the grace of state to remain chaste. They removed that entirely. Now you not become a cleric until you're a deacon. So you basically have guys living in a seminary for six, seven years without the grace of state. That's absurd. The second point, plus then you receive the graces that go along with becoming minor orders. Now the Vatican itself has said the minor orders and the ministries are not the same thing. The orders are an office, the ministries are a permission to use, to do those things, two different things. So it's, it's, it's something the church is going to revive. It's going to, it's going to have to, because I think that's what God wants. Your second question is? The second question is about the influence of music, because you know, when, you know that music affects our appetite, it affects our imagination. Right. So I just feel that music is one of those things that's not very much discussed in Catholic groups in general. It's not what, I'm sorry? It's not discussed how evil music can be or powerful it is. Yeah. Well, that's a whole lecture. Um, well, I think you kind of said it. Different kinds of music play on different faculties. So you have some music that plays on the concupiscible appetite, and so it drives people to concupiscence, and then other people, other kinds of music plays on the irascible appetite. We know that with rock, acid rock music and things of that sort. Chant actually appeals, I think, more to the intellect and will, and then um, classical music appeals to the intellect. The problem is, is that because of original sin, we have antecedent appetites. These are these appetites that are basically out of control. And one of the things is that when you listen to music in an unmitigated way, two things arise. One, you get a pleasure out of the music, and so guys become effeminate if they listen to it too much, especially the stuff that's very concupiscible in nature. The second component is it just aggravates the antecedent appetites if it's not properly moderated. And how do you know this? Take a teenager who's listening to music all the time and tell them to turn the music off, and what kind of response do you get? They just lose it on you it's emotionally, right? Well, and this is saying, and that, that tells you that there's some kind of emotional attachment, but that means it can also be deleterious to our spiritual lives. Saint, or no, it's not a saint, 
Socrates made, he was the very, one of the very first ones to talk about the fact that different kinds of music cause different dispositional changes as us and actually cause us to have different kind of emotions and inclinations and moods, etc. and that they would actually, this is why um, they would have different kinds of bands or certain kinds of instruments that would play when going into battle as opposed to what you're going to have your, your candlelight dinner at. Although maybe some people do that too. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but the point being is, is that it, has, it can have a, a spiritual impact on us. <clears throat> and I think that that's something that um, is something that's very important. I talk a bit about it, about it in my book on psychology. I also talk about it in this book I just came out with called The Principle of the Integral Good, where I talk about how uh, music can be evil or bad if one aspect of it is disordered. And so if you want to know what that means, you can buy the book. One more time. As a husband, do you have the right to put the bind the demon on your wife and children? Yeah, if you look at the actual structure of the natural law because you're authority, it basically it comes down to this. The ability to command the demon to leave is determined upon your ability to command someone in relationship to that thing. So, the fact that as a father you can command your children to do something means that you can command demons in relationship to them. You can't do that with your godson, right? You can't command your godson, come over and mow my lawn. He's not bound to that. Um, same with God, grandparents. Grandparents can't command their grandson, come over here and mow my lawn. Now, he might do it out of piety, but he's not bound to it. It's only the parents that are really they can bind. And it's the same thing with the husband in relationship with the wife and the wife in relationship with the kids. So it's based upon that ability to command in relationship to the thing because authority is the right of, of determination of the disposition of the thing. That's its definition. And so that means that if the demons incur on it, if you have the legitimate authority over them, you have the right to command them to leave. But if you don't, and you command them to leave, they know you don't, and then they can, you have no protection because God will protect the person who uses their authority in a rightly ordered way. So, okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, um, question. So we said that the diabolical thief attacked your imagination, but what about your dreams? Oh, yeah. Well, the, dreaming is actually a product of the imagination, memory, and the cogitative power. So, yes, they can. Although, on a, as a general rule, I tell people just ignore your dreams. If the, the, and I know we'll end here because it's time for uh, exposition, and then I'm going to go sit in the confessional but, um, until about 9 o'clock. But the demons, when the, the, the characteristic of demons is the cause is always some way in the effect. So if you're dreaming, the actual quality, quality not the content so much, but the quality of the dream will actually tell you a little bit of something about the demon. But it's too hard to discern properly. And so the church has always said, just ignore it entirely. But the two qualities of diabolic dreams that is pretty consistent is it will be extraordinarily lucid, almost like it's real, very colorful, very uh, vivid. The second is it will be very logical and follow an arc, like a, like a movie, right? And so uh, if it lacks those two, in other words, if our normal dreaming patterns are just mental garbage, and so they're kind of all over the map, they're not very clear, it's generally speaking, etc. Whereas when the demons get involved. But on the other hand, it's kind of hard to tell that dividing line. So that's why the church has always said and the saints have always said, just ignore it. Any type of dreaming you have, you just get up and you move about your business. If you think you're being affected with demons, um, there's in my book that I did. There's a prayer to commit. Uh, there's a called commission of body and soul, which you can say before you go to bed. The other one, which I started using myself one time, I, this demon was kind of agitating me because I was working on this one case, and so it just dawned on me. You know, my job is to be the instrument of justice to this guy. So I just turned to Christ and I said, you know, every time he does this, start punishing him for it. And. I fell asleep and slept like a baby after that one. <laughs> so, um, but you can try that. It's called the punishing prayer, which is in there. You can try that as well. Okay. If you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii, et Spiritus et Supervos, et Semper. Amen.